Hi, everyone. I'm McKenna. I'm the owner of Murder by the Book in Houston, Texas. And um, we're sorry for a little bit of a late start, but we haven't been doing uh, virtual events for a while. And so a couple um, tiny little technical difficulties popped up. But we are here and we're excited to have um, James Lee Burke talking about his new book today and Ace Atkins um, joining us as our moderator. Um, before we uh, I bring them on. I will say that if you have any questions or comments, don't be shy. Um, you can put questions in the um, comments on Facebook or in the live chat on YouTube, and I will get to those and um, you know tell them to the authors, and we'll have a nice chat in the second half of this panel. Um, we also have signed copies of um, James Lee Burke's new book, Flags on the Bayou, available. So I'm putting a link in the comments right now if you're interested in ordering those. Um, we would love that. Um, also, I do want to mention that while Ace Atkins doesn't have a new book coming out until 2024, there is a very cool reissue of his first Nick Travers book um, full of music and crime and um, wonderful Southern writing. And that reissue is available at Murder by the Book. Um, so that is called Crossroad Blues. I might have failed to mention that. Um, so James Lee Burke is a New York Times bestselling author, two times winner of the Edgar Award, winner of the Crime Writers Association Gold Dagger and the Grand Prix de Literature Policière, and the rep re uh, recipient of the Guggenheim Fellowship for Creative Arts and Fiction. He's authored 40 novels and two short story collections. He lives in M Missoula, Montana. And like I said, he's here today to talk about Flags on the Bayou. Hi, Jim. How are you? Well, hi, McKenna. How are you doing? I'm great. Thank it's you. so nice to chat with you. Um, we've had a long, long uh, friendship and relationship, yeah. and I've been a huge fan, and it's good to see you doing well. Many years. Many years. Um, we also have Ace Atkins joining us. Ace Atkins is the award-winning New York Times bestselling author of almost 30 novels. Atkins, a former SEC football player, started his career as a crime beat reporter in Florida before becoming a full-time novelist. Since then, he's written 11 books in the Quinn Colson series and several true crime novels based on infamous crooks and killers. He was also chosen by Robert B. Parker's family to continue the Spencer series in 2010, adding 10 novels to that iconic franchise. He lives and works in Oxford, Mississippi. And uh, another one of my favorite people. Good to see you, Ace. Good to see you too, McKenna. So I'm going to let the two of you um, have a chat. I'll be back on here in about 30 minutes um, to go through the audience questions. And like I said, to those of you watching, don't be shy. Get those questions on here um, for either author, and we'll get to those in a little bit. All right, you guys have fun. Thank you. Thank you, McKenna. Thanks, McKenna. Well, Mr. Burke, I, I've been reading the, uh, the book the last couple of days and not surprisingly, uh, greatly enjoyed it. I, I, every time I pick up one of your books, uh, there's that element of time travel in it. And this one was a totally immersive trip uh, back in time to Louisiana, back to the Civil War and being here where I can't get my camera working, but I'm right here on the Oxford, Mississippi Square. And it seems like a very James Lee Burke kind of day. It's raining and overcast yeah. and the, the ghost of Faulkner is out and about. And um, the first thing that came to mind was uh, the Faulknerian influence in, in this novel. Uh, was that something you were, you were conscious of? Was that some, a place you wanted to go? Or, or uh, We've talked about Faulkner before, but being here in Oxford, I have to ask you again. Well, if uh, there is an influence of William Faulkner in this book, uh, it has to do with the technique using multiple protagonists and first person narrators. So, yes, uh, he wrote, of course, As I Lay Dying. And it's one of his best books, I think. And one of the probably least uh, uh, lauded is, you know, of course, that was always his fate. I think Faulkner uh, never sold more than 5,000 copies of any of his books. Yes, sir. Yeah. But de that's definitely. Just, that's just us. That's a disgrace, isn't it? Is it <laughs> to say that. <laughs> it's the truth. It's a brief. Um, there's, a, there's a video clip from an old newsreel. I don't know if you've seen it, but I'll send it to you, where Faulkner is walking around Oxford. Uh, it's probably 
early 1940s. And he's talking to his uh, benefactor, Phil Stone, who was a, uh, oh, yeah. an attorney right here, not 100 yards from where I am. And uh, Phil Stone was talking about how he never made it, how Faulkner, this book didn't make any money. And I think it was Sound and the Fury as I lay dying. And it went all the way up to Sanctuary before he actually made a profit. But it, it is amazing. But certainly that, that influence of As I Lay Dying with that kind of... Um, baton race of passing the baton to each character yeah. moving along telling the story was just mm -hmm. evident and it's it's mm -hmm. fascinating because it's yeah. it's so immersive it's a his, it's hard to explain mm -hmm. this novel it is a historic novel but it is a it is a mystery um there's there's also just great action and i think again with the Faulknerian influence uh, i think sometimes people forget how incredibly readable and thrilling those books are but this is is a is a very psychological book but at the same time it is an immersive book that just pulls you in immediately um and the, the main characters here with with uh wade lufkin uh and i don't know if you want to talk about them in pieces or if you want to start with each one but but let's maybe let's talk about wade for a second because wade seems to carry a, a great amount of the load of this this narrative mm -hmm. Well, he, yes, he opens the book, and he's an idealist and a patrician, and he uh, volunteered uh, for the 8th Louisiana uh, Infantry, and th this was a unit, that was my great-grandfather's unit, uh, they just got pounded, they were at every battle in the, uh, <clears throat> what is it? He called the Shenandoah uh, campaign of Jackson. But uh, it, the, the engagements were such that um, I don't think we understand the amount of suffering that went on during those, those particular battles. Certainly, you know, Cemetery Ridge, and First and Second Fredericksburg, and of course, the real meat grinder was uh, at... Uh, Oh, uh, golly, it, uh, you know, uh, golly, I gotta, I'm stuck. <laughs> I'm sorry, just a moment. No, no worries. Um, I think that was the other thing with, with the novel, too, is the other book, and I don't want to get, I don't want to make this all about Faulkner. Okay. I was also struck yes. a lot of the similarities with The Unvanquished as well. Um, I, I kept on coming back as that tumultuous, um, apocalyptic time of being in the middle of an occupied city, finding everything just being terrorized. And it reminded me, and, it's, and The Unvanquished is another one of Faulkner's books that is, I think, one of my favorites, but not necessarily one of the most recognized. And they're just, it reminded me of that time of a, of a town just being pillaged and the, the anarchy that followed. It just seemed like a, a hell of a time to live, but a great time to write about. But I, I've never read the Un, Unvanquished, so I, I wouldn't know. But uh, <clears throat> the uh, <clears throat> events that occur uh, that you describe certainly were pervasive. I mean, William Sherman was, in effect, uh, a, it's not meant to villainize the man. He was what he was, but he was a terrorist. And he set the... Uh, programs, put them in place that were to be practiced from 1865 to 1891, and they were genocidal. That was the, that was the plan. Right after the war, all of those guys, those same Union officers, uh, they killed, burned, and murdered all the way till 1891 and wounded and Wade is really they our starved of a starved a race into defeat. And, and Wade is kind of our, our guide into that that patrician world that is being destroyed at that mm -hmm. time. His his family is a, he's coming from a wealthy family from a mm -hmm. certain upper class. Um, everyone we meet in this novel is from mm -hmm. a different class, whether they're mm -hmm. slave or whether they're poor white trash yeah. or whether they're a marauder, they're all coming at this story from all different angles. But so Wade was uh, a surgeon uh, during the war and um, uh, killed a man in a, in a, in an unusual um, type of way. And in, in, in an 
unusual event where he he had to take up arms against somebody. Can you tell, talk a little bit about his haunting of this one event where he actually has to actually kill uh, another soldier, something that he was not thinking that he was going to have to do during this time? Uh, yes, Wade is a gentle soul, and he's a, uh, an assistant to, to a surgeon. But he plans to be an artist, and he's in, uh, in, in he's a kind man ultimately. And the only reason, or on the only ground that he would accept as a soldier, would be that of a pacific person. And he was at uh, Frederick, not Fred, well Fredericksburg, but also he was uh, at the Battle of uh, Golly, my head. Was like this, this, I'm sorry. It's just, oh, nope. I feel like I'm my head's in a vice. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, but uh, it, uh, golly Moses, uh, you it's know, Shen heaven, Shenandoah. Oh, the, the worst uh, day of the war. It was Sh 23. Shiloh. No, it's worse than Shiloh. Uh, 1862 in Maryland. It's uh, Oh, golly Moses, anyway, she was. But <clears throat> yes, uh, he wanders away in a lull between battles. And it's a cold, very cold day. And uh, he sees another soldier who has a gray uh, blanket draped over his shoulders. And the other soldier is reading a book of poems by Robert uh, Browning. And uh, he, he, he hails the other fellow and says, uh, I've got the makings of uh, a snack. And I have some smoked uh, ham and, uh, and, and some coffee beans. And, and he doesn't realize that he's talking to a union officer. And the union officer drops the uh, blanket from his shoulders and he's holding a pistol. And uh, Wade is, is frightened and he says, sir, I'm a non-combatant. I'm an assistant with the surgeon. He said, I, I bear you no harm. And instead of receiving mercy, the Union soldier tries to kill him, but the pistol misfires. And Wade gets away. Uh, from the immediate danger he's in and runs so and grabs the rifle, which has a bayonet on it. It's the officer's rifle, it's Springfield. And he kills the officer. And this for the rest of his days bothers him, at least in, as long as we know about the things that went on farther down the track in their lives. But, uh, he realizes that there's no way to extract the evil that is going on, this enormous loss of uh, life. And 660,000 people, men, died uh, in that war. And I, I think we're not aware of that, uh, that, that, that there's a simplistic attitude that we have. Uh, I think we don't realize that I, 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 the uh, all the historian who uh, oh golly he's uh, he wrote four volumes the best history ever written of the Shelby story. Shelby Foot Shelby Foot who said we should not uh, view uh, the events of mid nineteenth century with 20th century eyes. Mm. And he, he, he wasn't being critical, he was just being factual, that these things, the things that occurred in were extremely um, uh, complex. But anyway, the story, the larger story in my book really is that the book, yes, that we're reading about, the readings uh, through 20th century eyes, uh, all those events occurred. Almost all of the characters have some biographical origin, and certainly the events are historical. They're 
They're written factually. Well, you talk about talk about the, the the foot quote about seeing things, you know, with 20th century eyes and looking back. And what did you do, mm-hmm. both in the language, the dialogue, the sense of place, the time, to to prepare for this book, to get the the language right, to get the feel right, to get no. what. That was no challenge. No, the issue is the story is about today. Hmm. It's about today. It is not about 1862. It's still there. Always like, now this is where Faulkner had the wonderful statement. You remember he said, uh, the past is not even past. It's, it's there. It's hmm. still there. It's like, a veil, you just reach mm. out and put your hand through it. And um, I, I, I wonder sometimes about where we are. You know, and I think, I'll answer my own question. I think we're at a crossroads. And I think we'll either be a, a, a true union, a pluralistic society, or we're not going to survive at least as we consider of ourselves, our own image. My father was far more erudite than, than I am. And I, I'll never forget, it was right after VJ Day, 1945. And my father was one of the best read and most intelligent people I ever knew. And I will never forget his words. And, and someone said, well, I guess it's all over, isn't it, Mr. Jimmy? And he said, no, it's not at all. He said, Russia is about to make its move. And he said, uh, we will become a neo-colonial power. We will walk in the same footsteps, the same sand as the British and the French. And they will come to the same end. And we will finally become not a great nation of leaders, but instead we will regress to the uh, Monroe Doctrine and our foreign policy will be based on weakness rather than strength and we will be done undone by ourselves. That's a paraphrase, but it's right close to it. But I think he was prescient and I think that's where we are now. We have created a non uh, uh, <clears throat> a non uh, uh, racial uh, underclass. It started back, and it was it's a, a bit it's a beaut. <laughs> what what the the con men <laughs> did to us about forty years or so ago mm. in the Teddy Roosevelt administration in nineteen ten. They, they learned that you can't fight, you can't uh, fight the government. I mean, the people who want to take advantage of our situation and get even richer than they are now. Instead of fighting with the government, they instead subsumed it. They just bought it and they got an actor to do it. And they've pulled it off. And this is not this is not a uh, my, my excuse me uh, conclusion. The uh, the man who was all golly he was very prominent in the uh, war, in the Republican administration about forty years ago. He said within two years the greatest transfer of treasury of money in history took place, and they did it in two years' time. And that's it. And so, in effect, uh, I think unless we understand some of the things that are occurring now, the same people are are still at work. The, The war between the states was really caused by a very small group of people. They were plantation people, but they were also newspapers. And in right before the uh, secession of South Carolina, they took, got together and they decided how to go. 
they they wanted a confederacy. They wanted uh, thirteen uh, uh, states removed from the governance in Washington, and they tried to sell all kinds of plans or reason for to other people. A raison d'etre. Uh, it didn't work. And then one man said, use sex. Make the emancipation of the black man a threat to every white woman and her husband in the South. That did it. George, first president of Bush, did it also. He did it. Willie, remember Willie, what was it, Horton? Willie Horton, they yes. did it again. They pulled it off again. They're really slick guys. Well, Mr. Burke, you just, think, yeah. one of the things that, you know, you, the points you make in the book as far as the yeah. the Civil War has never really ended. And yeah. uh, it's it's continually here. Mm -hmm. uh, do you do you find a glimmer of hope in, in all of this infighting and um, saturation oh. of, of media and talk radio and garbage that's out there is there is there any tipping point do you think that we can decency can can come back around <clears throat> well that's it we're at the crosswords i, I think it's almost a flip of the coin now <clears throat> i i don't share all of what my father said uh, and i i he was looking through certain pair of eyes you know, my, my father was very Victorian man, and, and, and a very decent and good man, and, and he was kind. But uh, what what troubles me most is something that George Orwell said uh, back, oh golly Moses, you know, back in the 1940s. In one of his essays, he said the first line was. Uh, the truth died in 1936. That's, that's what he, the truth died in 1936. And then he explains that, that the power of uh, electronics, and he was just talking about the radio, was such that a lie could be perpetrated uh, successfully uh, and have an enormous influence on people who are not educated and who in whom uh, fear can be inculcated. And I think we're far beyond that now. This, there, there are people here, you could watch them on television talking live. They're being interviewed on the street. They sound like they just got off a, a flying saucer. Mm -hmm. They just, that's the craziest stuff you've ever, it's well, like, benighted people <laughs> I, I know what i i'm a, yes. I'm a big i'm, a, a big, Go ahead. I'm sorry no 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 sir uh, yes, uh sir. i'm a big fan of films from uh the 1930s and uh you would see those elements of fascism that would be creeping in to talk about a lot of many yeah. of the films of frank capra yeah. and particularly a film uh one of my favorites called meet john doe uh, with gary cooper and in that film uh, it's about the media use of uh, fascist ideals and how it's passed on to the masses and the mob mentality. And I remember watching that when I was in high school and thinking it was such a strange film and such a, yeah. a time capsule. And it seemed like an era that we would never revisit again. But I never thought that that would become such a modern film today. But you watch that yeah. movie today uh, or you watch a film, another one of my favorites from the 50s, Facing the Crowd with Andy Griffith, which is one of the, I think, one of the greatest films ever made. And you see that idea, yeah. that mob mentality. But there's always a point in that film where the mob turns back on the person they're listening to. And that's what I always keep on waiting for. And it doesn't seem like that's coming back around. I think in storytelling, we see the mob is following the dictator. They're, they're following the fascist. Yeah. But then that tide switches and they turn back on that person. But I would have thought that would have happened some time ago. Uh, and I don't know if we're, we're past the point of no return. Yes, and I, I agree with you. I, I, I never thought we would do what we have done in the last few years. I never thought that would happen. 
And I, I wrote an editorial for a German newspaper paper right before the 2016 uh, election. And I said, the American electorate is like uh, the, uh, oh, the girl that you want to take home uh, to meet your mother. You, you, you might, might hang around with a girl who is not the one you want to do that, but you'll never take the, you'll never take a bad girl home to meet your mother. And I was dead wrong in that. We brought the bad girl. He was a bad guy. Oh, that's it. You say, I don't believe this. I don't believe this. I don't believe this. And you think, my God, it happened. And it's still there. Look, I just, I just, I can't understand it. I still cannot understand it. I cannot understand it. I, I, I got to, uh, I, uh, I'll always be, uh, I have to apologize this for the rest of my life. I uh, sold uh, barbecue tickets to a, a political rally for, oh, golly, Moses, my, uh, 1948, the uh, Dixie, uh, you know, party, uh, golly, Moses, anyway. The man is, anyway. Uh, Strom, I was loving Strom, sir. <laughs> Here's Tom Curley. Golly, here's a man who, you know, it's just, oh, gee, I don't, I don't want to. Okay. Uh, uh, he, he, he was a demagogue, and he, he, he was not a funny man. He put four men in, a, in an electric chair. One was a 17-year-old black kid who may, she killed a white man, but he may have acted in self-defense. He's not a funny man. But years later, I was at a, uh, a university uh, uh, honor. It's what it's the honors program, and the honors program would invite rather strange uh, speakers. And so the senator was invited, and I thought I'll I'll try to pay for my sins, and I'll go sit and listen to this fellow at the dinner for him. And so he went, <laughs> at this time, that was 1981, he was head of the Senate Judiciary Committee. He had enormous uh, political power. And he seemed, from what I heard, to talk only about uh, people on welfare and what he called, this is how he pronounced it, the media. <laughs> this, this is an exact quote. Why the media? They obsessive. When John Kennedy was killed, that's all they talked about for days. That's it for days. And I thought this is the man who put the. Nixon's vice president on the ticket, you remember? Yeah. <laughs> I said, golly, you, know, you think you're going to meet Lucifer and it's Elmer Fudd. <laughs> and the people love Elmer Fudd. <laughs> you can't even get mad at him. Oh, <laughs> sometimes you just, you know, I guess there's a point where you stuff in the world has gotten so insane and so crazy that it's like Elmer Fudd or like yeah. people walking off a UFO. Yeah. But yeah. These people, you, there's one line in the book that really, many lines in the book that really struck me is you talked about men walking around with great anger on their faces. I'm sure I'm misquoting this because they knew what they were doing was wrong, that it was morally wrong. And I picked yeah. that selection out specifically because it seems so true today. I see so men, see so many men, especially here in North Mississippi, with so much anger on their faces, with so much meanness and contempt, and they're following a path that I think you're right. They know that's wrong. They know it's immoral. Yeah. They know what they're following is wrong, but they're just captivated by it. But that one seemed particularly modern to me. Yeah, uh, you know, uh, uh, John uh, Grisham, you, you, you know. Yes, sir. Mr. Yeah, uh, he, he's a really nice gentleman. And 
uh, in, in his book, uh, The Chamber, in the film, I, I didn't read the book. Uh, I, I've read other things by him, but uh, I didn't read him, but I saw the film and Gene Hackman plays the role of a Klansman about to be executed. And the, the warden comes down and says to him, well, Bill, I'm sorry, but we're gonna have to do it. Do you want to say anything before we do? Be killed, the executed. And the character played by the actor says, yes, sir, there is something I want to say. For my whole life, I hated my, I, I was taught to hate. And for my whole life, I hated myself that was it he was taught to hate yeah. himself and that's how it works if you're from the south you know this is true yes, people were taught that the black man is your enemy mm -hmm. black man's gonna take your job away from you gonna take your school away from you gonna take your 40 acres from you gonna take your wife away from you and uh, that's what they were taught, and they it worked. And and I I I, I know uh, you know. Anyway, this I, I heard people say this years ago. We all picked the white man's cotton. <laughs> Got news for those guys who were mad. She said, "Whitey, up there in the big house on the hill." doesn't care if you're white or black, as long as you work for 40 cents an hour. That's how it works. And the biggest, <laughs> the biggest fear for all of them is the uh, people of the same class and if black and white would come that's together, it. and that's their biggest that's fear. It. That's it. Well, Mr. Burke, I've got about 500 more questions for you, but I'm not going to steal all your time. I wish we could talk more no. about it because I, I can't tell you how much I enjoyed it. But I'm going to bring McKenna back on here to have some questions from your many, many fans. Well, Hi. I they say, call, call me Mr. Uh, I mean, call, call me Jim. It's hard this for, it's for old, old me. Old people. It's hard for me, sir. I appreciate it. Ace, I've, I've heard him tell you to call him Jim so many times, and you still can't do it. That's hard. That's all right. He's a Southern man. He's a Southerner of the old, old, old school. I'm the same way. I cannot refer to women by their first name or ladies by their first name. Because when I was growing up, you do that, you get slapped upside the head. <laughs> you That's never talk to an it was in my elder family. We, man. But you for, know, for like, me, it's... it's how about it's, being called Bud? Hey, Bud, how you doing? You know, so I, you know, I want to say, well, I was doing fine until I... Met you, <laughs> hey bud, stay west, golly, yuck. <laughs> All right, well, we do have some questions from people watching. So um, uh, this one lady would like to know. She says she loves all of your book, all of your books, Mr. Burke, and she owns a copy of each. How are your horses doing? She sees a lot of pictures of you with them, and it seems that you get so much pleasure from them. Oh yeah, yeah. Horses are—they're part of the family. All, all, all pets are. Yeah. We have a 120-acre ranch, and uh, all animals, all animals are welcome. Mm -hmm. And so we joined the uh, <clears throat> a horse emergency program, but we're down to just two now. But, but anyway, we have a lot of critters, so lots of. Every, we have everything. We have wolves, but they have to tell them to go somewhere else. And throw, I haven't thrown a pine cone at one yet. But <laughs> Any day now. Them. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, so uh, we have another <clears throat> question, and I think both of you can probably address this one. Um, so when you're working on your historical fiction, because Ace, you've done historicals as well, how much time do you spend researching and how much, uh, excuse me, and how does that compare to the time you spend writing the novel? No, I don't. Uh, that's a compliment. I know. I, I know. Uh, but I, I don't research much. I, 
I don't. There was, there was one question I didn't yeah. get a chance to ask yeah. you, which is kind of tacked on to the, the question you just had, which is, can you just give us a little, there is there is the family connection. Uh, you mentioned mm -hmm. woman, uh, Ellen Lee Burke. Is she your, yeah. that's a true family member? Oh, yeah, that's my great-grandmother. Uh, and she had great-great-grandmother. Two sons that, Ellen Lee. Fought, that fought for the Confederacy. Yeah, there was three. Yeah, it was James, uh, William, and uh, uh, no, Moses. Uh, oh, geez, uh, Patrick. Yeah, okay. was, uh, and but they were they were, uh, they were um, um, uh, you know a abolitionists, and they were officers. And uh, Uncle Willie, they called him Great Uncle Willie. He was at Shiloh, and uh, that. That battle, I've written about it in two books now. That's that's his story. And the, the plantation in this book, uh, Lady of the Lake, was my great-great-grandfather's plantation. And uh, that his wife, that I'm probably going to get lynched by my own family, but his wife, wife's maiden name was, guess what, uh, <clears throat> Oh, my head went blank. Who shot Lincoln? With J James, uh, it's, it's mentioned throughout the booth. book. She's a booth, she's a booth which is broken. Yeah, she's a booth. She that was my great grandmother. Her name was Booth, and she was oh, born wow. in Wilkes County, Georgia, as in John Wilkes. <laughs> <laughs> the history is all is just everywhere. The other, the other <laughs> so really is it's danger. That's why I don't research. <laughs> this is what we find it's out. Part of your life. Did you ever send off, you know, a, a specimen to find out who your ancestors are? If you haven't, don't. It's really <laughs> discouraging. We found out. I, we always thought our family was involved with Charlemagne. Well, they were. We found out they were this primitive tribe that. <laughs> Up throwing rocks, you know, down on Charlemagne's head. <laughs> <laughs> that means you came from very hardy stock. That's it. <laughs> McKenna, did you have? I have another question. Okay. Um, Patrick uh, had the question that he used to live and work in Morgan City and Houston, and he finds that your background descriptions are stunningly accurate. So, mm -hmm. Mr. Burke, do you have a photographic memory? Well, I'm pretty good at it. Yeah, I, I do. I have a, a yeah, I, and of course, I, I grew up on the Gulf Coast in Louisiana and Texas, and I and have been in and out of there ever since, uh, you know, my I became an adult. So, but it's the the plain is here's the gift to an artist if you're from Louisiana or Texas, all of the things that have occurred in American history are are emblematically still alive. It, it, my family in New Iberia is still on the Baya 18, since 1836. My great, my ancestor, uh, uh, William Burke the first, Ellen Lee's husband, uh, was at Goliad. He survived the Goliad massacre in 1835, uh, you know, the Santa, the, the Texans surrendered and uh, they shouldn't have done it because the, the, the broker deal uh, was thrown over the gunnels and the 350 Texas boys were murdered. But anyway, all those things happened. And I, I remember right there, we, we sold our house now, but 12, 13 years ago, and I really miss it. But there were many balls in the heart of the live oak trees. Those same trees are still there. 22,000 Union soldiers marched right past our home. Uh, they were chasing Colonel uh, Mutal, who was, uh, he's in that, in the book also. That was my off my great great uncle's commanding officer, but, but it, what they went through was terrible. Just you know, the my great great grandfather, uh, 
his name was Perry, uh, was that, um, oh, golly, I, I get into all kinds of things. I'm sorry. I, I, I you know, one question I had about, you know, the, digressing. so, uh, so yeah. many of your books have the, that plane of existence that we're living on, that all time is the mm -hmm. same time. And, and mm -hmm. uh, one of your, uh, the, the last Robichu book uh, specifically had that. I like to think that the, the cottage where uh, Pierre Cochon, your constable in this book is living, might be the same cottage where Robichaud has his house. Is that correct or is that off? Uh, yes, exactly. That's, that's, that's where the, you got it. That's it. It's right next to uh, the uh, uh, <clears throat> shadows. There's an old pl pl uh, plantation home. It's been there since 1834, I think. But yes, right there on Bayou Tesh. And uh, his name is on the street that's where the drawbridge is. That's Bricks. I, I put that in there. I did it all the time. Of course. That's, <laughs> that's, that right. that's Robo Show's jogging route. That's where he jogs. That, that. That's it. Yeah. yeah. But it's a very old town. And, uh, well, it's like Oxford. You know, it's just, uh, golly, you know, it's just, let's see, Bedford Forest came through there in, what, 1862 or 63. I'm telling you and, about this. I'm, I'm sitting here in a building that was the first building constructed in 1871 after the town was destroyed even before the courthouse was rebuilt and so it gives me a sense of history wow. walking in here each day it was an old dry goods store and now it's been cut up into offices really? and that kind of thing but if you watch the film intruder in the dust from uh 1940s uh you see nothing changes you know and everything you know you still get those touches of of, of old oxford and and being you know, the, the world continues to, you know, go on and, and people grow old and, and are not here anymore. But the, the, the history and the, the town at some point still still remains the same. Is it in Absalom, Absalom, where the woman uh, uh, sees uh, the uh, <clears throat> oh, uh, c Confederates come into town and she has a... Uh, diamond ring and she scratches her lover's name in the glass i think it's so still there in the 20th That's, century well, there's even, go ahead oh, i was going to say there's even parts um i was fortunate enough to to know uh dean faulkner wells who was uh william faulkner's niece and he essentially raised her her father was a pilot um that had been killed even before she was born he was a subject of pylon uh, pylons yeah. and and it she would take me around and show me these bits and pieces of this was the the inspiration this gully way was when uh joe christmas this is when he disappeared when he escaped from the jail this is where this was and um in their house is still the the table where he actually edited absalom absalom they call it the absalom mm -hmm. absalom table and those connections to history i think i think maybe going back to the everything you've been talking about today mr burke is People that are so ignorant of history, I think this is why we're the, in the fix that we're in. We have a, you know, we have a sitting U.S. senator that thinks that uh, America was fighting the communists and the socialists during yeah. World War II. So, yeah. you know, people that are ignorant of history, I think, are, are yeah. more pervasive than ever. I'm sorry, McKenna. Yeah. You're good. We have to, no. we just have a couple more quick questions from the the audience before we yeah. wrap up. Um, I know the answer to this one. It's not a difficult question, but um, people in New Iberia tell me that you spend most of the time in Montana and people in Montana tell me you spend most of your time in New Iberia. Where are you now? Well, I'm in the basement of my house and uh, it, we call it the dungeon. And, uh, <laughs> golly, I, uh, oh, I, I hope to get back down to Louisiana pretty soon. I, I always miss it. But gee. I just really miss it, then. Uh, but uh, I think it's it's fair well, to say you're be. in Montana, though. Right now, yeah, I'm in in, in Montana. So, uh, but no, I was going to say something that, uh, that very often, and I have to remember this myself. That people get hurt, even though the intention of say a certain program is a good one. But the people sometimes who pay penalties, they do not deserve. For example, and uh, 
that uh, to, to say put one person ahead of another because of his or her race is yeah maybe that's right but maybe it's not but the point is somebody who never did anything wrong gets punished for something that happened many years ago and I always have to remember that that uh, <clears throat> that uh, golly Moses that people it's too easy to sometimes brush people off. And, and, and sometimes uh, people who are not educated maybe don't have the words they need to say, but their hearts are good. But they sometimes feel that they are penalized. Look, uh, what is it, Saturday Night Live? How do they portray uh, Southerners? They mock them. All the time. And, you know, just things like you know, destroying historical statues to get rid of the past is what people do in Afghanistan. Wise up. This is a gift to the guys you don't like. You are electing the people you hate. Don't give it a, give it a break. Talk to Cleet. Purcell. <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> anyway. Well, one thing you know, Cleet, Cleet would tell it the way it is. That's it. He would tell us the way it is. Yeah. One of the best characters in all of fiction. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, so we have one more question before we uh, right. wrap up. Um, what is coming next from both of you? Um, so why don't we uh, start with Mr. Burke and then um, Ace, you can tell us what to look for coming from you as well. Okay, what's for your, me? Yep, what's well, next? I have a book of short you. stories. Pardon? Okay. I, I have a book of short stories coming out in December and its title is, uh, <clears throat> ooh, just do it again. Uh, golly. Uh, Harbor Lights. And then I have a, a, a novel coming out. Uh, it's finished. But it's just called Cleet. Yes, Cleet is the narrator. And then I have a novel based on my mother, it's, and it's completed. And its title is Don't Forget Me, Little Bessie. Yeah. Boy, Mr. Burke, I'm very envious that you have all those projects finished. I wish I could be like that. Maybe someday I can get ahead. I just I have a book that's finished. And I'm also envious that you actually have titles already. We're still working on several titles. In fact, McKenna has been uh, graciously helping me comb through them to the point of 100 different titles at this point. So hopefully I'll have one before it comes out uh, from William Morrow next July. Uh, but I'll tell you what, Mr. Burke, your, your work continues to inspire me. Uh, if you can see back here, I have all of your books um, in first editions, and I've been collecting them since the early 90s. And um, I, I would not have become a writer had it not been for you. Well, that's very, very kind of you. Uh, but you have over 30 books pr printed. And some of, them are, some of them are, are okay. I'm still working on it. I still got a, I, I still got a lot to do. Yeah, but every, every, every artist is that way. As soon as you, you, you know the feeling. You finish the last page and you say, I didn't really get it all. And you got to do it all over again. Yeah. That's, I that's, guess that's, it's a compulsion. Yeah. That's the thrill of then, each book is I hope with each one I could get the next one right the way I want it. And that's, that's the, it. That's it. Yeah. <laughs> well, on that's that it. note, I'm sure your next books will get everything right. Um, we have signed copies of Flags of the Bayou, Flags on the Bayou available um, from James Lee Burke. Excellent. Thank you, Ace. And um, we always have Ace Atkins books in stock. And as I mentioned, there's a new reprint of Crossroad Blues that's just available. If you haven't read the Nick Travers books, I highly recommend them. Um, thank you so much for being with us today, uh, gentlemen. It was a wonderful talk, um, as I knew it would be. And I wish the best of you a, uh, a lovely rest of this hot summer. Thank you, well, guys. thank you, McKenna, and thank you, Ace, and I really appreciate your giving me all this time because I know it 
you all have lots of other things. A true, it's an honor. A true, to true absolute pr pleasure and an, and an honor for, for us as well. Well, yes. All right. Thanks, everyone, for watching. Have a great day. And I'm going to sign us all off. Thanks, everyone.